Throughout human history, there have been battles between the forces of good and evil. Today's list is all about the people that were so evil we truly wish they never existed. From awful world leaders to minions of demise, today's list features people we wish never got the opportunity to thrive. If you can call it that. So, without further ado, let us review our top 10 evil people from history we wish were never born. Number 10, Tomas de Torquemada. Ever heard of the Spanish Inquisition? Well, this guy was one of its star killers. Not only do we wish it never happened in the first place, it did, so we might as well talk about it and learn from it. But we can't discuss the Inquisition without mentioning Tomas, who was responsible for thousands of deaths. He gave people two choices. Either join the Catholic Church or die, which led to thousands of Jewish and Islamic people being exiled from Spain. He played the role of inquisitor and was in charge of investigating and punishing heretics. He oversaw the burning of thousands of innocent people, as Tomas often used cruel methods of extracting confessions from people he believed to be heretics. He seemed to almost enjoy his job hanging, burning, suffocating, and tormenting people with the rack and waterboarding. No one knows exactly how many people died during the Inquisition, but historians estimate anywhere between 30,000 to 300,000. Pretty, pretty wide gap there. Number 9. Caligula. Man, his name is too fun to say. Too bad he wasn't a fun guy. It's better I tell you now that essentially this list is a depiction of what happens when the wrong people get their hands on power. From 37 AD to 41 AD, Caligula ruled as if he was some kind of mad god that needed to be satisfied. Not only did his addiction to gambling cause a nightmare for the economy, he seemed to delight in suffering. In the first three months of his rule, he made his people sacrifice 160,000 animals in his name. When he first took over as ruler, people actually liked him though. He made helpful political reforms and were called exiles, but most people blame his future tyranny on a brain fever that befell him later on. He blew money on lavish projects, some still helpful like aqueducts, to building a two mile long floating bridge across the Bay of Bali so he could ride his horse across it day after day. He even ordered his men to attack the sea by collecting shells with their helmets. His lascivious love affairs included copulating with the wives of his allies and even allegedly his own sisters. Caligula's reign was equal parts terrifying and embarrassing, which is probably why his officers stabbed him to death. Number 8. Leopold II of Belgium During the height of colonialism, Leopold of Belgium wanted to make his mark by conquering the African Congo. As soon as I said colonialism, you know, you know where things are going, so get ready. He made it his property and instead of, you know, being a good human being, he decided to establish a dictatorship instead. He made the rest of Europe think that he was acting as a good guy, so they'd give him money, then proceeded to hire mercenaries. These mercenaries were set with the task of draining as much money from the state by enforcing free labor camps. Anyone who disobeyed or failed to meet demands were severely punished and even had their limbs removed. Leopold was responsible for the deaths of 20% of the population and thankfully was stopped before he could do more damage. Roger Casement, after doing a little digging, released a report which detailed the horrors he had committed under the guise of philanthropy. He was forced to surrender the Congo, though it was considered a part of Belgium until the 1950s. <sighs> Whew, buckle up folks, it only gets worse from here. It's number 7 and we're already at Genghis Khan. Get ready. Genghis Khan, ruler of the Mongolian Empire, killed so many people. He changed the carbon footprint of the earth. In one single battle, he killed over 1.2 million people. Though this sounds like an exaggeration, I don't find it hard to believe, since he just left the corpses to rot, the battlefields became oily and whole mounds of like mountains of bodies formed. Genghis Khan was supposedly responsible for over 40 million deaths. If you need a number to compare that to, that's the same amount of people who died in World War I altogether. He also enjoyed in excess the spoils of war, brutalizing women and assaulting them. In addition to that, he held mass beauty contests and all those who didn't win would be given to his soldiers like objects. Mm. Because of that, around 16 million people are said to be descendants of him today. That's how many people he... Yeah. Many people blame his brutal and ruthless upbringing as Khan very much had to raise himself under the mentality to kill or be killed. He even killed his own brother at age 10 just for not sharing food. He was also horrendous when it came to tormenting his betrayers. Some ways include pouring molten silver down their throats and sawing people in half while they were still alive. Oh, and he killed 75% of the population of Iran and tried to commit an entire genocide. Yeah. 
The list goes on, but so does this list, and there is more to come, so let's go. Number six, Talat Pasha. Pasha was the Grand Vizier to the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire in the early 20th century and was the main architect of the Armenian Genocide. When Armenian families were evicted from their homes in 1915, his signature was on the orders. On April 24th, they executed several hundred intellectuals in order to begin Turkifying the country. Many were sent through the Mesopotamian desert on death marches without food or water after being stripped naked so the sun would just boil them alive. Anyone who stopped walking was shot. He also created a special organization made of killers and ex-convicts who were ordered to carry out the liquidation of the Christian elements. They drowned people in rivers, threw civilians off cliffs, even crucified and burned people alive. Yep, this happened in the 1900s, by the way. So there are about 600,000 to 1.5 million reasons we wish this man never existed because that is how many people Pasha was responsible for killing. Ooh, man. Number five, Idi Amin. General Idi Amin staged a coup on January 25th, 1971 and forced Uganda's first prime minister, Milton Oboe, into exile. From there, he created a reign of terror that abused Uganda's freedom after more than 70 years of British rule. Amin organized mass executions of Akoli and Lango Christian tribes who were loyal to Oboe. He terrorized his own country with internal security forces whose main purpose was to eliminate those who opposed him. His brutality also resulted in the collapse of the economy, this man just seemed like he just didn't have a single good bone in his body. He was also rumored to have eaten human flesh and his vicious and inhumane rule resulted in the death of 300,000 civilians. Eventually Amin was forced to flee and sought refuge in Saudi Arabia, though he was never punished for his crimes and died in 2003 due to organ failure. So he got away with it, essentially. Number 4, Pol Pot. Hmm. You'd think a leader's job would be to protect and serve their country with love and respect, but I guess Pol Pot didn't see it that way. Originally named Salazar, Pot was the leader of the Khmer Rouge totalitarian regime during 1975-79 to in Cambodia, though technically longer. It was a radical communist government who caused the death of more than 2 million people through forced labor, starvation, disease, torment, persecution, and execution. He wanted to purify society and wanted to extinguish capitalism, western culture, city life, religion, and all foreign influences in order to form a pure communist regime. All media outlets along with embassies and external medical help were refused and essentially he barricaded Cambodia into their own little world. Education was halted, healthcare eliminated, it was crazy. The people were forced into slave labor on the killing fields, only allowed 180 grams of rice a day. Deadly purges were conducted to eliminate remnants of the old society including monks, police, doctors, lawyers, teachers, ex-soldiers along with their families and former government officials. His cruelty and madness knew no bounds. It took years for him to finally be put under house arrest by his peers and was never truly punished for his crimes against humanity. He died of a heart attack in 1998 following his arrest. So yeah. And we're reaching our top three. <laughs> I bet you thought, I bet you thought number three was going to be number one. Nope, there were worse people than him, believe it or not. Number three, we have Adolf. I can't say his last name because apparently YouTube won't let me, which is ridiculous. He's not Voldemort, but you know who I'm talking about, that really evil German guy. Yeah. I don't really need to go into detail here unless you don't know about one of the most infamous genocides to take place in all of history. Along with the amount of people Adolf's army killed in World War II, his warped and disgusting worldview resulted in the destruction of more than 6 million lives, mainly those of Jewish descent but LGBTQ, political prisoners, and basically anyone he and his followers deemed a lesser human. He was the personification of hatred and led the world into one of the most deadly wars to date. We should also give a shout out to all of his henchmen who served underneath him, all working together to enact one of the cruelest moments in history. If he hadn't been born, who knows if it would have happened anyways due to political and social tensions at the time, but maybe, just maybe, it wouldn't have happened at all and all those lives would still be around today. Number two. Guys, like I knew he was bad, but 
dug deep today, dug deep today, and I did not, I would never, never thought I would say this, but number two, Joseph Stalin. Joseph Stalin made his own henchmen disappear in photos, and boy do we wish it was him instead. Stalin was the premier of the Soviet Union and was responsible for the deaths of more than 20 million, 20 million of his own people, double that if you count World War II. He ruled for 30 years and ruled with an iron fist, eliminating anyone who opposed him, and as you can guess, there were many. In 1927 and 1929, he had 1 million people exiled or imprisoned, 9 to 11 million were forced off their lands, and 3 million peasants were arrested or exiled in the mass collectivization program. 6 to 7 million were killed by artificial famine in the 1930s. During 1936 to 1938, he executed approximately 750,000 during the Great Terror, a brutal political campaign to remove dissenters and any others he considered a threat. He was so paranoid. This guy had no regard for human life whatsoever. While the world was focused on Adolf, he was doing all of this, and he was fighting on the Allies' side, though he started supporting Hitler. And then he came onto our side. Anyways. Mm. It is estimated that Stalin orchestrated the deaths of 60 million people, which means about 40,000 people died every week during his raid. Need I say more? And if you think that's bad. Number one spot, Mao Zedong. Ready? I don't think anyone can be. Mao Zedong during 1966 to 1976 turned China into a house of fear by eradicating 65 million people. In his attempt for a socialist China, he killed anyone that got in his way, kind of like Stalin, through execution and mass starvation. His biggest threat was the intellect. And revered Emperor Shi Huang, who buried 460 scholars and sought to surpass him by burying alive 46,000 scholars. Yeah, my stomach turned when I read that. That's awful. He coined his operation the Great Leap Forward. To combat rising resistance, he created the Red Army, composed of girls and boys from the ages of 14 to 21, to roam cities and target enemies of the state, especially their teachers. He would make the teachers wear dunce hats, cover their faces with ink, and make them crawl on all fours and bark like dogs. He also expanded a system of a thousand forced labor camps. Most amazing fam, I could go on, but I honestly don't have room. It just seems like there's no end to all the awful things that he did. For all these reasons and more, Mao is of course in our number one spot. Number 10, Elizabeth Bathory. I remember one time seeing a theater production where they kind of glorified this woman and I was like, you realize what she did, right? Bathory was one of the most evil women to ever live on the planet Earth, period. It wasn't just how many people she killed, but how she did it. Like Vlad the Impaler, she is being compared to a real life vampire and is even from the same area. She was born on August 7th, a Leo, like me. <laughs> I swear we're not all crazy. August 7th, 1560, in a prominent Hungarian noble family, making her practically untouchable. She married a war hero named Count Frenes Nadazny. I probably butchered that, sorry, but so did she. Huh. Who was suspected of gifting Bloody Lizzie with the skills she used to kill. After she died, Bathory became obsessed with immortality, supposedly when one of her servants accidentally spilled blood on her and her skin appeared younger. Bathory then began her mission of horror, luring over 650 young virgin women to her palace and brutally taking their lives. She was even bold enough to lure daughters of nobility. Before draining them of their blood, she would slice, stab, sew their mouths shut, leave them out in the cold, cover them in honey so bees would sting them, let her dogs tear at their flesh, and she herself would bite off skin from their face and other intimate parts, shall we say. When she was satisfied, her servants drained the blood into a bath. When she was finally caught, three of her servants were executed, but she was locked away in a tower for the rest of her days, forced to rot away. I feel like that wasn't good enough. You know, that's just not good enough. She was probably able to roam around the castle too, like it wasn't a big deal. Like I said, untouchable. Number nine, Maximilien Robespierre. As one of our commenters said in part one, Wes Gunton said, power corrupts the good too, not just the evil. Good quote, man, nice. Maximilien Robespierre started out with good intentions before he lost his head. You can look at the French Revolution through two lenses. One is like, Yay, they got rid of an idiot king, that's so good. And then the other lens is, oh my God, there's so much blood everywhere. Why are there so many heads rolling around? It was nuts, like it was not a good time and I don't 
think it was okay at all. And that's all to do with Maximilian. After Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI were beheaded in 1793, Maximilian continued the bloodbath without mercy. Ironically, he was the head of the Committee for Public Safety. Huh? But accused many members of the National Convention of treasonous and unrevolutionary activities just like willy nilly. He was like, you're a traitor, you're a traitor. In less than a year, 300,000 people were arrested, 10,000 died in prison, and 17,000 people were guillotined. So many heads! One by one, he sent them all to the guillotine until he eventually was elected the president of the National Convention. Within six days of being president, he passed a law that suspended the right to a public trial and to legal assistance and by the end of that month 1400 people were guillotined. Talk about trigger happy. Finally the right and the left reunited in order to overthrow Robespierre in order to destroy the vicious dictatorship he established. Looks like he was too busy forging ahead with his plans that he eventually lost his own. Number 8. You also said I think in the comments that you wanted this guy on this list, so we're here. This list is very much for you, so... <sighs> Number 8. Vlad the Impaler. Good old Vlad. Oh man, he's been romanticized a little bit as well, I think, as the OG Dracula. But trust me, with that beard and that temper, he was about as sexy as a hot dog dressed as a salsa dancer. Whatever you imagine Dracula could do, what he did was worse. A lot of the awful things that he did were fed by a pension for revenge, but still, it must take a certain kind of person to do what he did. And there's plenty more that I just didn't have time to say in this video, so... Let me know if you just want me to do a list about Vlad. I'll do it. At a young age, Vlad was shipped off to be raised by Turks, which resulted in a brutal upbringing. On top of that, his entire family was killed during a coup, leading young Vlad to plot his revenge. One of the first things he did as a ruler was hold a massive banquet in the guise of making peace with his enemies, lulling them into a false sense of security with a cup of wine, you know? That is before he announced that they would be having shish kebabs for dinner. They were the entree. Most of his guests were stabbed to death while others were impaled on stakes while they were alive. <laughs> Quite literally, like, hey Vlad, how do you like your steak? Rare. Anyways, all the while Vlad watched. Some even say he let the blood drip into his goblet and continued to drink from it. Number seven, Ivan the Terrible. To have a name like that, you must have done something really, really bad. Or a few things. Very bad. Ivan the Terrible, or Ivan the Fourth, as he was formerly known, was the crown prince of Moscow. It's instances like these that just highlights one monarchy is just such a bad idea. You know? You just never know what's gonna pop out and have a crown put on its head one day. This guy gave off major Joffrey vibes from the start. When he was just 13, he ordered the arrest of Prince Andrew Shusky so he could feed him to his ravenous dogs. Joffrey or Ramsay? Both. Let's say both. He also tortured animals for fun, and if you've been with this channel for a long time, you know what that means. But for a while there, love seemed to have subdued him, for after he married Anastasia Romanova, he was relatively calm for about 13 years, until the day she and her son fell ill and died. The reign of terror resurfaced with a vengeance. He formed the notorious Opreninki, a league of soldiers clad in black, ordered to murder anyone they deemed traitors to God, even barging into churches during mass. Back at the castle, Ivan engaged in some pretty sadistic acts of sexual nature of both men and women, and married a sum of eight times with each wife mysteriously drowning or being sent away to convents. Yeah. He even beat to death his eldest son and his wife who was pregnant at the time. Needless to say, the world was glad when he left it, though Russia wouldn't recover from years of disarray until Peter the Great took over over a hundred years later. Rough. Number six, Bloody Mary. And I'm not talking about the one you see in the mirror, okay? This is an entirely different one. This is like the OG. You don't get bloody put in front of your name for nothing. Rulers loved to use religion as an excuse to kill mass amounts of people. Well, I mean, people still like doing that today for some reason. Anyways, which is why Mary I of England 
earned the title she did. When her father Henry VIII created the Church of England in order to divorce her mother Catherine so he could marry Anne Boleyn, this essentially bastardized Mary due to the allegations of incest he made against her mother, changing her life for the worse. She was forbidden to see her parents and stripped of her title as princess, but when Anne died, Mary took a lot of convincing to rejoin the court and was named heir to the throne, but she never saw her dad really as the head of the church. She was still a devout Catholic. There are a lot more details, but with the hatred she bore her father when she finally became queen, Mary did everything she could to convert England back to Catholicism and married Philip of Spain. Over the next three years, she burned hundreds upon hundreds of Protestants at the stake. Like, again, like why can't you just, just kill them? If you, want to, if you want them dead, why do you have to torture them? I don't know. Her bloody disillusioned tirade appeared to have no end in sight, but after she lost a devastating war and Philip abandoned her, Mary soon fell ill and died leaving all her Catholic dreams behind her. Thankfully, good old Queen Bess was on the sidelines so Mary's bloody rampage ended when she did so love Queen Elizabeth, she was great. Anyways, Number 5! We're mixing it up here, it's not all rulers. Charles Manson. I feel like I could just leave this guy's name up here and I'm not sure if I'd have to say anything else, so I think I'm gonna go now. Kidding, I'll keep talking if you want. But if you need a reminder, he was an incredibly twisted cult leader that orchestrated the killings of several people, most famously actress Sharon Tate. He ran a cult in the 1960s called the Manson Family where he slowly but surely convinced his followers that he was pretty much a god. His eyes were drawn from science fiction, <laughs> so you know it's true, and the occult and preached that an apocalyptic race war was coming. He was a master manipulator and one of the ways he kept his followers close to him was by gaining dark secrets, even if he had to create them himself. He led the group to believe that in order to unite them as a family, they all had to kill the people he said they had to. Little did they know that Manson had one of the groups attack the Polanski house due to a record deal that never went his way like years before, even before Roman even moved there. <sighs> I've said it before and I'll say it again, it's one thing to do the killing yourself, that's brutal, but it's a whole other thing to convince other people to do it for you and for them to believe that it's the right thing to do. Like just wow. That's a whole different level of evil. Number four, Luca Magnata. I'm, uh, I hate him. I hate him. I hate him so much. Was he a mass murderer? No. But did he commit one of the most haunting and terrifying crimes that still makes me want to vomit to this day? Yep. Do I wish I'd never watched the documentary Don't F*** With Cats? Absolutely. Something about this crime struck a chord in me that I just can't shake. Jun Lin should still be alive today, but he isn't because of this man. Scarborough, Ontario native Luca Magnata started out like most killers, killing animals in brutal and public ways. History is 2020, and there were tons of clues as to where this pathological need for attention was going to end up. Luca not only brutally killed sweet, innocent animals, but filmed them for all the world to see and put them on the internet. Why nobody, I mean, there's a bunch of people trying to track him down, but still, like, where were the police? That's like, this guy's literally like, I'm a killer, catch me. He set the internet on fire, and when that got the attention he wanted, he upped his game and violently stole the life of Concordia student Jin Lin. He did everything he could for attention, and the pathway towards his bloody deed is so inhuman. But apparently he's doing just fine in prison. He got married recently, which is good for him. I even hate the fact that I'm talking about him right now, so let's just move on, shall we? There are bigger fish to fry. Number three, Abdullah of Saudi Arabia. Back to our evil rulers theme we had going for a while there. King Abdullah has to be on this list. He violated so many human rights throughout his reign and the fact that his rule was actually so recent just goes to show that we aren't so far away from the horrid rulers of the past. He was ruthless when it came to heresy against his reign and would severely punish and torment any and all who spoke out against him in a very 1984 kind of style too. To give you an example of just how far he went, he sentenced a blogger to a thousand lashings and 10 years in prison just for setting up a website and saying his piece. That would be like me or any of the MA hosts being arrested for saying any critique against the government on this channel. Like that's insane. And he didn't stop there. The blogger is just one example of the thousand political prisoners who have been arrested and tortured just because they asked a question. King Abdullah died in 2015 and his reign remains a controversial one as he did also try to negotiate peace in the east but but many will always remember his medieval ways of torture and imprisonment. Number two, Nero. 
level. Nero the Zero. Last time we talked about Caligula and I believe some of you mentioned him in the comments so I feel like we have to talk about Nero. I honestly don't know what it was with Burning Pyres as I mentioned before. Like, just make it quick. Just get it over with. If you want someone dead, why make it slow and awful? But that's because Nero enjoyed watching people burn to death. <laughs> he just loved it. It was the best. What didn't this guy do? He used burning Christians as lights for his garden. He kicked his second wife to death. He killed his mother and brother to secure his evil rule. The man seemed to delight in cruelty the same way we love eating cake on our birthday. Another common form of punishment was having the criminal tied to a post and torn apart by animals. He had a fascination with animals. He was so weird. What Nero reportedly did to a woman named Lacosta, a woman his mother hired to kill his father and brother, will haunt your dreams. He had her assaulted by a specially trained giraffe before she was fed to animals. How did you how did he train a giraffe to do that? It's my question. He was more than likely a sociopath with even weirder sexual tendencies. He also loved animals being involved, like a bloodier and sadistic furry. He would often dress up as a beast and have his array of lovers, male and female, tied to posts and pretend to bite them. Okay, like, I mean, do you. Or don't Nero, don't do you. I don't even know what that is. Nero was an arrogant, narcissistic ruler who even had his own crowd of people who followed him and cheered for him, but that was about the only people who cheered for him. That was it. And last but not least, Joseph. Mengala. I feel like I could do a list of a bunch of evil people from World War II because there were just so many. Mustache Man was just one head of the Hydra because of course there was the Angel of Death, Joseph Mengala. Cue the shiver down your spine. He besperched the name of doctor because the last thing he did was value human life. When we think of the atrocities of World War II, Auschwitz and camps like it are a black stain that forever left the world changed. However, that was Mengele's haven. He was the one who selected and administered the gas in the chambers, but his horrors didn't stop there. He was infamous for his inhumane and horrific genetic and hereditary research he performed on unwilling patients, specifically twins. He would infect one twin with a disease, i.e. typhus, and transfuse the blood between the siblings to see what would happen. He even put like petrol in their bloodstreams. How crazy is that? He also tried to change people's eye color through nefarious means and the list goes on. The saddest, most painful truth about this man was that he was never tried. The families of those who survived never got to see justice get served. Though, in a poetic sense, it kind of was. Mengele escaped to Brazil and used a false name for many years, but it was later discovered that he had a stroke while swimming and drowned. But when his body was discovered, they decided to use it for medical studies. Great. Coming in at number 10, we have Pope Alexander VI, aka the Borgias. If you want power, don't bother trying to be a king. Becoming the Pope is much more lucrative. Hesitate to put him on this list was that if he didn't exist, we wouldn't have the Borgias, which was a great TV show. Anything with Jeremy Irons, I am in. But this guy, along with his whole family, were about as corrupt as they come to the point where we can't help but be like a little bit impressed. He achieved the papacy through nepotism and bribery and then continued to make his family the most powerful in the world wherever he could. His children Cesare and Lucrezia Borgia were notorious for their illicit affairs and even murder, with Lucrezia being referred to at one time as the Black Widow of Rome. Though her father often used her as a pawn he married off to rich merchants and then when their usefulness expired he claimed the marriage to be null and void so he could just do the whole thing again. He also allegedly held massive orgy and challenged those in his company to see who could do the most of it. But worst of all is this, something called the Intercatera, a papal bill he issued that authorized Spain and Portugal to colonize and enslave the Americas and Africa. So I guess we all know why he's on this list, besides all the rest. Number nine, the Purdue family. Ha ha ha. Speaking of families, right? Wow. One bad apple spoils the whole bunch, and that is definitely the case with the Purdue family. This family conned their way to becoming the richest family in America, taking the lives of over 200,000 people without even lifting a finger. The Sackler family accumulated their $13 billion net worth when their private company called Purdue Pharma developed a revolutionary new drug called. Oxycontin. Their slogan was the drug to start with and stay with, and they assured millions that it was 
safe to use. Oxycontin contains something called oxycodone, which was a relative to another very deadly drug featured very strongly in the film called Train Spotting. Ever heard of Chasing the Dragon? But it was two times as powerful as morphine, and what a breakthrough for pain management. And they couldn't help the $35 billion it made for Purdue Pharma. They continued to market oxycontin as a safe drug to use, but instead, they caused the opioid crisis in the 1990s. Good job, Big Pharma. Mark Claypine. The Ecole Polytechnique was one of the most horrific acts of hate ever performed in Canada. After a roller coaster ride academically, Mark Lepine was denied entry into Montreal's Ecole Polytechnique engineering program. But no one knew that this would be the straw that broke the camel's back. On December 6, 1989, Mark walked onto the campus with a concealed semi-automatic weapon. Once inside, he separated the men and the women and then opened fire on all the women while shouting, you're all feminists. He then ran into the hall shooting any woman within his sight. He then took his own life and in the note that he left, he blamed feminists for ruining his life and included a list of 19 more feminists he should have killed if he hadn't run out of time. Mark Lepine walked into the school with the intention of killing every single female student in that at school just because he was mad that they wanted to be engineers. What is known as the Montreal Massacre shook the nation and became known as one of the deadliest shootings ever to happen in Canada. We wish we could forget the man, but let us always remember the woman who died. Number seven, Robert Picton. I hate him so much. Here we have another Canadian serial named Robert Picton. Between 1978 and 2001, 65 women went missing in and around Vancouver's east side, gone without a trace, and a lot of them were women of the night. So there was, shall we say, a flagrant lack of enthusiasm when it came to looking for them. Picton owned a pig farm, which to the unseeing eye looked to be just that until police made an all too morbid discovery. What started out as a search for illegal firearms became far darker when they found discarded items like an inhaler, a shoe, a shirt, so on. Pigton confessed to taking the lives of 49 women, though he was only tried for half of that, though many of the bodies weren't found because he fed them to the pigs. Anthropologists even brought in a conveyor belt to sift through the dirt in order to find the evidence they needed. What's even worse about this story is that they could have caught him earlier. One of the women he attacked escaped after they both inflicted stab wounds on each other. They were being treated at the same hospital and the police found a key in his pocket that fit the handcuffs she had on. But the case was dismissed however because she wasn't considered a reliable witness due to her drug addiction. So great police work there. Gold star. Number 6. Oh, ho, ho, Jeffrey Epstein. Yes, yeah, yeah, we are here and here he is. If you have been lucky enough to have been living under a rock, then move on. There is no reason for you to even know his name, you lucky human. But for all those who've heard it but aren't quite sure what happened, well, you might as well know now. Epstein was a wealthy financier who seemed to have unlimited connections with the world's elite, but for reasons that go beyond the material. Epstein was convicted, to put it lightly, of exploiting and inappropriately taking advantage of female minors. He abused and manipulated young women into recruiting other young women into his circle of exploitation. He would lure them into giving him massages for money which would turn into… yeah. The authorities compiled a 53 page long indictment that gave a hefty reason for Epstein to be given a lengthy prison term, though prison is where he died. Epstein was found unresponsive in his cell several weeks after he entered prison and it is believed that he took his own life, though some people suspect foul play. Due to his wealthy connections to people like Prince Andrew, there is a much bigger case here which makes Epstein the perfect example for someone we wish never existed. Ugh, I hate this guy. Ugh. Number 5. Albert Fish. Ugh. The Grey Man. You've probably heard of him before. You know me, you know this channel, and you know we talk about some pretty dark stuff, especially people who like to, I don't know, viciously kill for a living. But out of all of the ones I've covered on this channel, this name still feels like ash in my mouth. The crimes of Albert Fish were so abhorrent, it's almost unfathomable. Also known as the Brooklyn Vampire or the Grey Man, he killed one victim for every state or so he claimed. A notorious sadist, he exploited, kidnapped, and tormented his young victims all while hiding his deeds from his wife and his six children. Which was pretty easy at first. He looked like a regular shy guy on the street, someone you wouldn't look twice at. 
but beneath that facade of the ordinary lied an extraordinary killer. He also practiced masochism and would regularly punish himself by lighting his body on fire and puncture himself with nails. If he did that to himself, we can only imagine the extent to which he went when it came to his own victims. Awful. Awful human being. Ew. Get out. Number four, Madame LaLaurie, Richard Cow. I hope I said your name right. Um, but you re recommended this, Richard. As soon as I saw this name, I totally face palmed. I was like, of course. Uh, why? Why? Why did I have a brain fart? Of course, she should be on this list. This woman should never have existed. Slavery was already exploitive and cruel. That shouldn't have existed in the first place. And this woman brought it to a whole new level. She's on par with Bathory for me for sure. The best part about American Horror Story Coven is we got to like imagine that she got her comeuppance because she never actually did. Delphine LaLaurie was a French aristocrat in New Orleans who exploited, tormented, and treated the slaves she owned viciously. Like she enjoyed it too. Others had suspicions of her cruelty, especially when a slave woman ran and jumped to her death because LaLaurie was chasing her. After that, she was forced to sell her slaves but bought them back secretly through family members. But things really came to a head on April 10th, 1834, when authorities rescued a 70 year old slave woman who was found chained to a stove. She had set the house on fire in order to escape her mistress, but instead led the men up to the top of the house where they found LaLaurie's medieval torment chamber. Seven slaves were tied and spiked with iron collars, and that was barely a scratch on the rest of the things she did. A town mob gathered outside the house, but she never faced any real punishment for her crimes as she fled New Orleans because her reputation was ruined. Whoop-de-doo. Number three. Jim Jones. About a dozen of you requested Jim Jones, so here he is, and rightly so. The poster child for the phrase, all together now, don't drink the Kool-Aid. Cult leaders are the worst. Hint, if someone says they are the Messiah and that you should follow them blindly, <laughs> Just run. What makes this man so awful and so terrifying is just how effective he was at manipulating people. Jones was the leader of the People's Temple cult in San Francisco and led under the title The Prophet. The cult began in the 1950s, but later in the 1970s, they came under scrutiny from the public. So he convinced his 1,000 followers to move to Guyana in order to set up a commune where they could all live peacefully. But that was the last thing on his mind. He confiscated their passports, all of their money, blackmailed and threatened their lives. So I guess now we know how he kept his followers. US Representative Leo Ryan went to the commune to investigate the claims of abuse, but was killed by Jones along with his four members. That same day, November 18th, 1978, the culmination of his leadership called the Jonestown Massacre occurred where he ordered his followers to drink cyanide laced punch, killing every single one of them. Get rid Jim Jones, don't like you. Number two, Kim Il Sung. Oh, let's hope no one in North Korea is keeping an eye on this channel because today we have to talk about the Korean War, which means we have to talk about Kim Il Sung, which means somebody in North Korea right now is probably very upset about this. Kim Il Sung was directly responsible for the Korean War that separated North Korea and South Korea. After World War II, when Japan surrendered, Korea was split in half the North occupied by the Soviets and the South by the US. Kim was appointed by the Soviets, aka Stalin, remember the first list, to the Provincial People's Committee. From there, Kim created the Democratic Republic of North Korea, where he developed a cult like following, built up his military, eliminated his competitors, and by 1950, he announced to Mao Zedong, remember the first video, and Stalin that he was ready to unite Korea under communism. June 25th, 1950, he attacked South Korea, amounting to the deadly loss of over 3 million people. When the war ended in a stalemate, Sung was heartbroken, but he was still determined to rule. He enforced his communist regime where all information came from the state, true or otherwise, and exaggerated and villainized anyone outside his territory. To ensure everyone behaved, whole families who spoke out against him would just disappear. He basically created a real life 1984. That's what happened. Because of him, North Korea is what it is today, a nuclear bomb waiting to go off. But according to them, it's the other way around. What do you think? Let us know. Coming in at number one, again, at least a dozen of you were like, this guy. There's at least one evil German World War II leader on this list, and we all know the reason. Again, nearly a dozen of you suggested him across both videos, so here we go. It was one thing for a soldier to come knocking at your door, but the SS struck a whole different kind of fear. 
Himmler was the reason why. Heinrich Himmler is one of Adolf's most famous henchmen and was the second most powerful man in the Third Reich. In April 1934, Himmler was appointed assistant chief to the Gestapo in Prussia, but made sure to spread his influence across the whole Reich. He was the mastermind behind the Purge, or the Knight of the Long Knives, where any competitors of Adolf were eliminated by the SS. This secured the ruler's position, and Himmler went on to create the most powerful armed body in Germany. But above all, he was the one behind the conception and implementation of the so-called final solution, which resulted in the death of 6 million Jews. So need I say more? Number 10, Martin Shkreli. Oh, this freaking guy. He makes me so mad and no, he's not a serial killer. No, he isn't some cruel world leader. He is a man who decided that making money was more important than helping cure a devastating disease which is so funny, or helping people ease their symptoms. Imagine that the vaccine that could save your life, I don't know, for COVID, and allow you to see your family and hug them cost more money than you have in your bank account. Imagine if someone did that during this pandemic. We wouldn't be happy, would we? Now, now you know where I'm going with this. Martin Shkreli is the creator and founder of Turing Pharmaceuticals that acquired 62 Daraprim in 2015. Daraprim is used to treat a life-threatening parasitic disease and prevents toxoplasmosis in patients with HIV. It's also used to treat cancer, malaria, and AIDS. So, pretty damn important. Shkreli decided to find a way to raise the price from $13.50 to $750. Yeah, making it unattainable to many who needed it. A 5,000% overnight increase despite the fact that it only costs around a dollar to make. Yeah, work that out. Shkreli's argument for the increase was that he wanted to use the money to invest in creating a new, better drug. Yeah. Sure, dude. Funny enough, in his 20s, he caught some attention for encouraging food and drug companies not to approve the drugs he was shorting in the market. So if you're a fan of GameStop, you know what I'm talking about. This is the kind of guy that they were trying to teach a lesson to. The price of the drug still remains the same today, and Martin is now in prison for fraud, and he will not be let out early. Good. Number nine, Lavrenti Beria. This one was put forth by commenter Brian Runyon, and what a good choice. We talked about Stalin in part one, and it only makes sense that we talk about Beria. Aside from the ruler himself, Beria was the most hated man in the Soviet Union. When Stalin passed away in 1953, the horrors of his rule were far from over, and Beria can be thanked for that. During the 1930s, he oversaw the bloody purges and succeeded Nikolai Yezov after he was shot by Stalin on Beria's recommendation. He ran the Soviet network of slave labor camps and indulged his dark delights in some of the worst ways you can imagine. He loved to torment the prisoners in a variety of ways, and his cruelty knew no bounds. I can't go into detail without being bleeped to heck, so you can imagine. After Stalin's expiration, he took over state security and internal affairs, which put him in control of the secret police, leading to many people fearing him more than they did Stalin, which says a lot. As a result, conspirators within the party had him forcibly removed and executed, though some believe that he escaped as the events of the arrest are cloudy. Still, a bunch of evil men were scared of an even more evil man, so he must have been that bad. Right? Number 8, Ila Koch. Born in Dresden, Germany, Ila hopped on board the German Evil Party campaign pretty early in 1932 and later married Karl Otto Koch. It was this union that would lend her all the resources she desired to satisfy her bloody lust and really macabre Pinterest ideas. By that point, let's just say this power couple makes number nine. Karl was the head of the Sachsenhausen concentration camp who was later commissioned to build a new concentration camp called Buchenwald. Ela, meanwhile, earned the title of the B B witch of Buchenwald due to her sadistic and inhuman tendencies. She would ride her horse through the camp and whip prisoners and had, shall we say, eclectic tastes when it came to interior design. She loved trophies, Buffalo Bill style, and she delighted in lampshades, book covers, and gloves made from, well, it wasn't cow leather. She even had shrunken human skulls. It was due to the many testimonials of the prisoners at the camp that Eel was tried for her cruelty, though sadly, she never completed her full sentence. She took her own life in her prison cell. 
Is it, is it bad that I wish someone turned her into a toilet seat cover? Number seven, Emperor Hirohito. About a dozen of you across two different videos recommended Hirohito, so here he is. Like most of the world, Japan in the 1930s was in no way peaceful. One of the most horrific atrocities in the world occurred under the reign of Emperor Hirohito called the Nanking Massacre. In 1937, Japanese troops stormed the Chinese city of Nanking, where they slaughtered and tormented thousands of people in the most impossibly brutal ways. The events are closely related to the Sino-Japanese War and World War II. The second sino -Japanese Japanese war was a conflict between Japan and China where Japan tried to essentially invade China. Chinese forces left the city of Nanking, though some stayed to defend it, but the result was a relentless widespread brutality. According to some documents, Hirohito did try to say that he felt bad, and some believe there was little he could have done to stop it as he was considered a figurehead. But still, figurehead or no, Hirohito approved of the annihilation campaigns in China, which included burning villages to the ground. The official numbers of how many were killed during the massacre are roughly between 200 to 300,000 people, probably more, and that doesn't include the millions that were killed during the rest of the wars they fought. Number six, Fred and Rose West. This next recommendation comes from Central Dark's Lucy, and I am very much in agreement. Fred and Rose West were two people that should have never existed. Yet they did. What's worse is that many considered them charming and normal, a good laugh. But what they didn't know were the horrific crimes they were committing in their very own community. The West sadistically tormented and took the lives of at least nine young women on record, including their own daughters between 1973 to 1987. The majority of them took place in their very home, which was constantly under construction, in order to cover up the crimes. While neighbors thought they were fixing up the garage or the garden, they were instead making their very own graveyard. The victims they took who were not a part of their family right, were lured under the guise of needing nannies. Fred took his own life after he was caught, though Rosemary is still living out her sentence. When I asked Lucy why this crime haunts her above others, she had this to say, and I quote, just the simple fact that they were hiding in plain sight, neighbors had no idea what was going on, a lot of their crimes they tried to credit to their bad upbringings, which is disgusting to me, just awful, awful people. She also recommends the book Fred and Rose, the full story of Fred and Rose West and the Gloucester House of Horrors for anyone who wants to know more to try and understand how evil like this could possibly exist. Number five, John Wayne Gacy. This was kind of like a me one, I really hate this one. John Wayne Gacy, never mind it, I had to eventually put John Wayne Gacy on this list because for similar reasons to Fred and Rose West, he was hiding in plain sight. Behind that painted joyful face was a cruel sadistic man who took the lives of way too many people. I can't even begin to imagine what it would have been like to be his wife or his kids and finding out that this happened. Gacy took the lives in brutal tormented ways of over 33 boys and hid the corpses in his very home. He hid behind the guise of a party clown named Pogo and was a community favorite. Everybody loved him. I think the fact that we can be so blind to something so blatantly horrific is the most terrifying part, but there were clues along the way. The first time he was arrested for an attack, like this was in 1968, but was released after 18 months for good behavior. But when he was finally caught, the justice system served him up the death penalty and um, guess there's no release on good behavior for that one. Number four, Jean-Claude Duvalier. Haiti has been so resilient throughout the political and environmental turmoil it has faced over the last several decades, with the rule of Jean-Claude Duvalier being one of the reasons. He violated so many human rights in order to maintain the dictatorship. Under his leadership, the lives of hundreds of political prisoners held in the triangle of death were mercilessly taken. Many of the families still have no idea what happened to their family members. On top of that, they experienced the infliction of severe pain and maltreatment in order to extract information. Plus, the reason there were so many political prisoners was due to the heavy restrictions on freedom of association, assembly, and expression, meaning many radio stations and newspapers were closed and journalists were thrown into prison as well. Evidence heavily suggests that in November 1980, he ordered the mass arrest of activists who were later tormented and expelled from the country. Duvalier is responsible for one of the worst examples of mass human riot violation, and we wish he just simply never existed and his father too. Number three, Harold Shipman. Harold Shipman was responsible for taking the lives of over 260 patients who trusted him. 
Despite heading into medicine for noble reasons, his mother died when he was 17 and he wanted to dedicate his life to medicine, it had a deadly price. After attending the University of Leeds, he failed his entrance exam, which should have been like a stop sign right there, but he ended up getting a placement and was fired early on after that because it was discovered that he was forging prescriptions. Another thing that should have stopped him from ever being hired again. But nope, Donnybrook Medical Center and Hyde took him on and boy was that a mistake. Thankfully, the local undertaker noticed a crucial pattern that probably saved hundreds more lives. He noticed that Shipman's patients were always found sitting or reclined on a couch or sofa, and then on top of that, Angela Woodruff's mother died, leaving behind a will, giving everything to Shipman. Hmm, that was that. Turns out Shipman was lethally injecting each patient before they left his office, giving them just enough time to pass away when they got home. Angela's mother had just been to see Shipman that day, and were it not for Angela, Shipman may have taken many more lives. No one knows why he did it, perhaps he was trying to avenge his mother's death, or maybe he just liked playing God, who knows. Number two, H. H. Holmes. Another very popular recommendation, H. H. Holmes. No relation to the fictional and benevolent Sherlock Holmes, though he is the reason behind the name. Dashing and deadly, Dr. Henry Howard Holmes is infamously known for his murder castle that ensnared victim after victim. He was in fact a genius, finishing school at the age of 16 and earning his doctorate by the age of 23, but earning an honest living was far from his mind. In fact, as a child, he showed an interest in medicine by practicing surgery on animals. In medical school, he got into the habit of stealing corpses and conning insurance claims, and as an adult, he conned and worked his way to earning enough money to construct his dream murder castle, or mansion of death. A hotel of labyrinths that led to peril. Each level was booby trapped with trapdoors, mazes, and, and chutes that would drop his victims into the basement where vats of acid, quicklime, another version of acid, and a crematorium lay where he would yep, burn the bodies. Like his old medical school days, he also took out insurance policies on his victims to fund his macabre endeavors. Historians still debate how many people he killed, but currently it sits around 200, probably more. Number one, the chessboard killer. I actually had never heard of this person today before Olivia told me. This next guy was actually a recommendation from our good old buddy, Olivia. Here is why she thinks he is one of the absolute worst and deserves to be on this list. And I quote, I think his quote, for me, life without murder is like life without food for you. I felt like the father of all these people since it was me who opened the door for them to another world. Really sums up how evil he is. He is able to not only justify his killings, but he also feels good and proud of them. When he was caught, he showed no remorse and instead showed a desire to be remembered for the acts. A lot of evil people committed their evil acts with the intention to gain something, but he did it just because he liked it. He knows what he did wrong, but he just doesn't care." Unquote. Yeah, I agree. Alexander Pushiskin was built to be a killer and I truly wish he was never born. Primarily targeting elderly homeless people, he would lure them to a graveyard to drink on his grandfather's grave and then beat them to death. He committed the crimes in Bitsa Park and when he was caught, he confessed his 61 killings and even showed in detail how he accomplished each and every one. When a connection to the supermarket he worked at was revealed and they searched his house, they found a chessboard with numbers on almost each square. Hence the name, The Chessboard Killer. I've been your host Rachel Fisher and until next time, take care guys.